Good evening. I'm Anita Taylor. I'm the Dean of Duncan of Jordanston College of Art and Design, and I'm here to welcome you to our Christmas lecture. Um, it's the first of a series of occasional lectures in art and design presented by the School of Art and Design, and they really focus on our approach to thinking through making within our subject areas. DJ CAD prizes itself on its excellence in teaching, research and public engagement. Um, we found through this period of lockdown how much more we can reach out to our community, both our staff, students and publics, um, to present things that we find of particular interest and things that we'd like to focus on. We're really thrilled this evening to welcome the artist Emma Talbot to give our Christmas lecture. Emma is really a fantastic artist. She studied at Birmingham Institute of Art and Design and the Royal College of Art in London. And she's currently a tutor in painting there at the Royal College. Her work has been exhibited at Eastside Projects in Birmingham, at Arcadia Missa in New York, at the Kunstmuseum in The Hague, at Turner Contemporary in Margate, at the Drawing Room in London, the Freud Museum, Gallery Onrust in Amsterdam, and many other places, including Tate St Ives in Cornwall. Emma is known for her multidimensional practice that explores the narratives with female representation at its heart and often autobiographical references woven within that. In March 2020, she was awarded the eighth Max Mara Art Prize for women in collaboration with the Whitechapel Gallery in London and the Collezioni Marimotti in Italy. And through this award, she's working towards a solo exhibition at the Whitechapel Gallery in 2022. There are many reasons to invite Emma as our guest speaker this evening. She was a selector of what's now known as the Trinity Boy Wharf Drawing Prize in 2014. And she's included in the forthcoming Fiden publication that look at new perspectives in drawing. So vitamin D3 is now published and features Emma within that. But tonight she's going to discuss her practice as an artist working across the whole range of media and to focus on the research, development and production of recent works, including her forthcoming one person exhibition, Ghost Calls, with our neighbours down the road in Dundee, Dundee Contemporary Art. We're really, really thrilled to welcome you, Emma, and I'm going to hand over to you to give the lecture, to say an enormous thank you for joining us. And we're really looking forward to hearing about your practice and particularly for the audience in Dundee to hear about your exhibition that we hope will be open in the new year. So thank you, over to you. Thank you. And thank you so much for inviting me and um, thanks for that wonderful introduction, Anita. Um, as Anita said, I'm going to um, talk about my work generally for a brief bit of time, and then I'm going to really focus on the work that I've made for DCA. Um, just bear with me while I share my screen. Okay, so um, in talking about my work, I think the best place to start is um, with drawing. And, um, that's because drawing is a way of kind of getting thoughts down. It's a way of looking at what I'm thinking. It's a very open practice for me. I really don't know what it is I'm going to draw. I just let myself kind of download whatever, whatever thoughts I have, explore whatever's preoccupying me at any point in time. Um, and it's really hard to choose because I make a lot of drawings, a sort of typical drawing. But this is called... Um, the contracting universe. And it's like the shape of a womb with a baby inside. And there are these radial lines that are like contracting muscles. And it's as if the baby is about to be born. Um, and it's in this kind of space that's like, the womb is like a universe. So it has these references a little bit to mountains or clouds or plant forms or kind of energy lines. And it has these snakes surrounding it like it's a kind of natural universe um, and I'm really fascinated by the fact that what unifies all of us is that we've all been born but most of us really can't remember the fact the, the experience of being born so that's really strange isn't it that 
we've done something quite fundamental, but we can't remember the experience. So it's almost as if it becomes mythical, as if it isn't quite real. And a drawing like this might then prompt, um, oh, here's a problem. I don't know why suddenly my, um, I don't know why uh, I can't show the slideshow. We tried it earlier and it worked. So are we okay? Please work. No, let me just come out of this. Fine. Sorry about this. I don't know at all why. It's really not a problem. These things happen. So let's try it again. Um. Oh, yeah, good. Okay, don't know why. Um, so that uh, a drawing like the one I just showed you um, can prompt a much larger piece of work like this uh, is a piece called uh, Your Birth, the Epic Historical Moment You Can't Remember. And this is from an exhibition in the Chem Kunstmuseum in The Hague. And it's an oval platform with uh, references to birth um, made in three dimensions in very sort of rudimentary ways with painted fabric and sewn and stuffed forms and painted silk. And it's really about our own birth, that notion of us not remembering the experience. And it's laid out like you might see artifacts in a museum um, from an ancient culture. And you might look at them and wonder, you know, what were they for? What, what did that mean? What, what's the experience of these artifacts? Uh, it's a kind of uh, narrative of distancing that um, is our experience of our own birth. And the, the, there's a female figure at one end and you see that the baby that's being born is crowning. And that's our first appearance. You know, when our head is crowning when we're being born, that's the first time we, we're visible. And at the other end of the um, platform is a, a figure that's holding a selfie stick. And it's like that figure is then becoming visible in a virtual space. Oh no. <laughs> so, I'm oh, sorry, I don't know why this keeps stopping. I'm going to uh, have to try to, can you see that? Not at the moment. No, okay, right, so try again. Sorry about this. There are lots of advantages to Zoom, but it's awful when it does terrible things like play up. Okay, so that's brilliant. Okay, so I just wanted to show you some animation. My animations are made of um, digitally cut out um, drawings. And hopefully if it works, I'm gonna show you something like two minutes of drawing and it really, this underscores, I think a lot of themes in my work.
So um, in that excerpt, you saw uh, the female figure who is common in my work because it's a representation of myself. It's myself seen from the inside rather than an external view. So it's an idea of what, it, how I kind of project an Im imaginary idea of myself. And uh, she doesn't have a face. And that's because when we look out at the world, we can't see our own faces. We're not aware, aware of our own faces. We just see a, like a kind of portal that looks out onto the world. And this figure is moving around in a space which is very demanding. She's in a kind of uh, set of structures that are like, um, you know, the capitalist structure we live in, which is expecting um, exponential growth and progression. And she's striving and trying to kind of climb up and falling down. And there are all these alerts and um, ringtones that are like technology, the demands of technology. And there's pollution and there's industrialization and there's sort of growth of the city and the kinds of structures and systems that are the backdrop to where she lives. And in that kind of struggle, um, there's, there are a set of contemporary concerns, which really are the sort of space in which I, I quite often, in, I interrogate those spaces and I kind of cast this sort of sense of personal thought and monologue, internal monologue into much wider prevalent concerns. And then quite often the figures are a bit like seers or, you know, they can look outside of their situation and they can try to think about how they might think or how else they might think. And so this last piece of text that said, whose voice is this speaking in silence? Not a God or a government, it's you, your being thinking. It's that really that underscores my work so much, which is, you know, that we all have our internal voices and our idiosyncratic thoughts and they they work in relation to the wider world. I kind of had a feeling that this might happen. Go back again to try and reboot this talk. No. Um. Uh, okay, so maybe, I'm so sorry about this, I really don't know why. Um, okay, so um, I'm just going to briefly show you these works. The This is also from the um, Kunstmuseum in The Hague. Uh, it's a piece called How Is Your Own Death So Inconceivable? There's a set of painted images on the outside of this shape, which is a kind of volcano. It's like a volcano erupting, but the idea is a kind of metaphor for death that we all know that we'll die, but we don't know when or how. And so it's like a, a volcano that could erupt at any moment. And there's a metallic head uh, a sort of reflective head sleeping on top of this volcano shape. And on the outside are painted images of women looking for portals, for ways to kind of escape this finality of death. And there's also a figure who's transfixed looking into the eye of death. And inside you see a cave. And in that cave, sorry if I move myself out of the way, you can see it. There's a cave with a fossilized figure inside uh, on a rock and the interior is painted like it might be marble or rock inside, like a kind of fixed idea of death. Um, oh God. So uh, this is really... I'm so sorry, Emma, I'm not sure what's happened. Just, it's not a problem. I can't seem to um, just carry on with the... Uh, Right, so hold on a minute. I have no idea why. Right. Mm. I wonder whether it's always a good idea to keep going back into the slideshow. 
but anyway, let's keep going. So these are images from um, the show that I had very recently at Eastside Projects in Birmingham. Um, it was a show called When Screens Break, and it's a circular um, series of painted silk hangings. And on one side, there are images that describe our own um, um, interconnection with technology. So it describes how much we've been seduced by our devices, how they became like our friends, how we would pour our thoughts and emotions into our devices, and how then we became networked. Um, and on the other side, hooray, it changed. Um, there, there are images of uh, people who are so involved in a kind of virtual space, like a virtual reality, that they're disconnected from the tangible world. And it describes, I, ma I made it before lockdown, but it describes the tangible world as a world that is kind of full of viruses and very dangerous for us at some point in the near future, I was imagining. And so we sort of exile ourselves into a virtual reality space to protect ourselves. And then someone dreams that they go to the um, old tangible world and they can't believe what a beautiful place it is, even if it's rotting. Ah, oh, good. And then uh, on the inside of this um, circle, this kind of narrative circle, you, uh, you can walk inside and there's a, a series of painted foil hangings that are like a screen that's smashed because it has these kind of metallic lines that are like cracks on a phone screen. And then you go inside that, it's like you go inside the screen and then there's an animation which also narrates this same subject. So um, I'm hoping that you can read these two texts. Um, these are two texts that were the starting point for the exhibition Ghost Calls, which is at DCA. Um, as soon as DCA can open, you'll be able to see it. So um, I kind of wanted to resist reading it out loud because I'd rather you heard it in your own voices, in your heads, but to, to um, maybe save time, I'll just read it. It's, do you detect some return like a ghost rapping on the walls? The 20th century leans a bony hand on your shoulder. Austerity's grandfather points into a horrific pit, that broken century, the smashed world. Watch yourself. Oh. <laughs> mm. I'm Right. Oh, okay. Do you hear ghost calls? This is where the title of the show came from. Acceleration and speed, the screech of tires, loss of care, recklessness on a blind corner heading toward terrible destruction, a scream. Can you hear it? How is horror silent, silenced? The sound of a crash in fast and slow motion. I'm so sorry about this. Not to worry. I have, as I keep saying, I have absolutely no idea why. Uh, no, right. Right. Okay. So those two texts as a starting point were really something that I'd been thinking about for a while about how our period of time in the 21st century could be mapped so closely onto the 20th century. For example, in the 20th century, um, futurism described the speed of a motor car. And that really transformed the kind of human understanding of, um, you know, how, how we could travel, how we could, you know, this kind of idea of acceleration being very exciting and, and dangerous. And in the 21st century, we have this, 
a futurism, which is the speed of technology. And we have accelerationism and we have this idea of kind of pushing things to their extreme limits to see what might happen. Um, both early parts of both centuries, uh, there was a rise in nationalism. There was a rise in right wing politics. There was a rise in populist politics. There was a huge divide in both periods between extreme wealth and excess and the poverty of the average wage. And in both periods, there was a pandemic. So it made me think that if a ghost of the 20th century looked at our era, they would say, watch out because something terrible is about to happen because in the 20th century, obviously there were world wars. And I was thinking of this before the pandemic hit, but I think that we're in a period of time where obviously a lot of our systems have crashed. Um, a lot of things don't work the way they used to work. And we're in the midst of um, a huge sort of life-changing event. And so the first thing you see in the exhibition is this silk hanging, which is four meters by three meters. And it describes a kind of huge crash, like a smash up, like a screwed up world. And there are these figures, these women who are like the survivors stumbling, shocked and falling out of this crash and really wondering how can we move beyond this crash? And they're, they're stepping out of the wreckage of their former lives. And it's like a, an image you can't, you, you have to confront before you see the rest of the space. And in the rest of the space, uh, apologies. I think it's because I talk too long with each slide. I think that could be the reason. So in the rest of the space, there's um, a, a space that the figures might move to, that a kind of future. Um, so I, in my research, I was thinking about making the future space a kind of massive landscape. And I was really thinking about landscapes in Scotland um, and looking a lot at landscapes in Scotland and thinking what, while we're in our lockdown experience, we really want to go outside and we really want to embrace the kind of natural space in, in a very um, different way, I think. And then I was also very interested in the Celtic tradition of keening, um, because I thought after a terrible event, you don't just jump from that kind of event to the next chapter in your life, you, there's a kind of lot of grieving that goes on. There's a lot of processing. And I thought if this group of women who I want to be the figures that move from this big crash into a future event, um, if they're a group of keening women, then maybe they're the people who can guide us from one place to another. So keening was an activity that was performed by professional mourners. Um, they were women who would go to the household of someone who died and they would do this kind of singing, wailing, moaning kind of sound. They would tell stories of the person who died, but they would also make these grieving sounds that helped the family access their own emotional grief, but also that were supposed to carry the soul of the person who died to the next realm. So I started making drawings, which were uh, for me trying to imagine these keening women exploring a landscape. Mm. I think it might be that you need to use the arrows. I know it might take it through. Right, that's what I've been doing. Okay. It doesn't work. work. I'm, not, I'm really not sure how to get around it. Unless... I wouldn't worry about it. We can manage. We're, we're still getting a fantastic sense of, of the work. Yeah, sometimes like then the arrows worked and other times they just don't. So anyway, um, yeah. It, another thing that I looked at when I was um, developing this uh, 
exhibition was I went to McManus on one of my trips to Dundee and I saw this amazing painting by John Duncan, the Riders of the She. And what fascinated me about it was that this is a Celtic revivalist painting and it was painted at this period of time that I've been describing the early 20th century. Um, but he's drawing on an, an ancient culture to kind of try to think outside of his own era, to try to think of another way to progress in the future. But what he does is he takes these um, artifacts that are in the McManus and artifacts from Celtic, you know, that have been, uh, that are archeological finds, uh, Celtic objects, and he places them in the painting. So like the, you see these um, horse um, headdresses, they're like shields for horses. They're, they're inside in the image, in the painting. And it's like he's saying, here's the evidence of this culture and here's the image that describes the culture. And I found that really striking. Um, and the she were a group of people who in a battle, in, in myth, in a battle, they uh, lost a battle and they were banished to the underworld. So these are the figures who, who they're a group of people who were buried. Um, and the women of the she came out from the underworld and as banshees, and they made these calling sounds to warn people that they were going to die. Um, and obviously that kind of connected to my thinking about these kind of ghost calls. And then there are these um, Pictish carved stone balls that um, are the size that you could hold in your hand. And I was really fascinated by um, the fact that they were found all over the landscape in Scotland, but nobody knows what they were for. And I liked the detail of their carving, these kind of radial lines and spirals. Um, but I also like the fact that things that seem so prevalent and they seem like they, they're part of a commonly known thing can become totally unknown. Right. So here's my epic landscape. It's 15 meters long. It's um, acrylic on silk. Um, it's very thin. So you can, as you walk around it, you can see from both sides, the paint goes through to both sides. And I've got, um, it's, it's not um, meant to be read in any order. It doesn't go from left to right. It's not a linear um, narrative. Um, and there's a frieze at the top, which, it, which shows these heads of women who were like ghosts calling and they're floating in a landscape as if they've seen everything, they've been in the landscape forever. And then the group of keening women are exploring the landscape and I'm gonna show you those panels in sections. So here's the first section. Um, it's, um, a woman who's, I'm trying to move this so you can see it there, a woman who's putting her hand into a whirlpool. And it says, do you hear ghost calls, a teary lament for human existence, a shout out to the living to take more care of themselves, of the world, of each other, unlocking portals to other worlds, reaching beyond the surface to find meaning. Oh. <laughs> this is super. Uh, frustrating. Right. Um, in this section, you see the women climbing up a kind of stony edifice, but it's also like a huge kind of head says let's climb through this grief together it's so much bigger than us the sorrow of our age the sorrow of all time and on the right on the right hand side panel there's you see a figure coming out of the eye of that stony head and it says accept, accept our status as temporal 
terribly fragile and magically robust, passing from one era to the next, let go of what was to find the ways past and future could meet in a state of far out being. And in the middle is a figure that I think of like a widow who's holding onto a rock where her loved one has been buried and she wants to stay there and just stay with them. But the truth is that, you know, because she's still living, she can't, you know, time will move on. And it says we can't hold on to the static past a fixed or fixed ideas. Everything is in flux and we're still alive or we're still living. Um, and you see in the centre panel here, there's uh, like a weeping willow that a woman's underneath as if the tree is crying. Um, okay, here are some um, drawings that I made from Celtic, uh, drawings of Celtic birds. And I was really fascinated by Celtic imagery because if uh, you and I looked at these images of birds, we might say that we it's quite hard for us to recognize that they're birds. And if we looked at this image from the Book of Kells on the left-hand side, it would be quite hard for us to know that that image is called um, animals and a human entwined. So we might look at that and think, well, what animals are they and where's the human? And we may not be able to recognize this imagery, but there must have been a consensus in the time of its making that meant that people would understand that's a convincing depiction of animals or of birds. Um, so we see in this landscape, there are women uh, walking through the landscape and encountering these Celtic animals and birds. And it says, our intermediate now balances on a tipping point. The earth tilts on its axis, offering another view of the cosmos, a system of layered time, visible and non-visible presence. We'll soon be obsolete predecessors dark age, clock time humans, the ideas of our era, incomprehensible abstractions to future generations. Facts become fantastical notions, become facts. And I must admit, I was thinking quite a lot about our, the Trumpian era that we were living through where fact and fiction and truth and non-truth were becoming so indivisible and so um, completely confused that it felt more and more important to me that what we think of as realism is not um, reliably real. And, you know, obviously we live in a post-truth era. There's also a figure here who is standing on rock, which is like a kind of larval um, composite or an agate, and she's calling upwards to planets and then these rocks are calling as well saying harmonizing with ancient symphonies, astral and earthly, synthesized slow motion vibrations, lava, agate, fossil. Um, and this is these are the final panels there. A woman being transported by a Celtic bird it says a cast of birds transport a passing being to the edges of time and space. Not you this time, you travel in your own storm. And then a woman uh, in conversation with a Celtic bird says, let poets speak, listen in to voices you never heard before. Give space to the deliciously unfamiliar that expands understanding. And um, finally, the this image, like a moon in the sky, it says, this is not the end. Let's use the time we have together embracing a forward movement without fear. 
this is really work that's made for our time now because the one thing that we can't do is be together embracing but we can use the time we have together embracing a forward movement without fear we can think about how we'd like to live what we think is important and what we care about now oh, i'm so sorry that this is like adding on extra time to this Little time and okay. i don't mm. Okay, so hopefully now I'll show you a bit of an animation that's in the um, exhibition. I think I want to start about here. <laughs> So um, the figure um, comes out of the crash and goes into the head of death. So she's exploring inside the head of death in the stony silence of the ear canal. She goes into the stagnant pool of the mind of death and swims through it. Then she's in the cave of rotten teeth um, and while she's exploring this space, she looks out of the eye socket of the head of death and sees the moon. So um, this part of the, an the animation is 15 minutes long in the exhibition and this part is like an introduction. And then after that, there are four different keening songs by four different keening women. Oops, okay. So as, we, as you look around the exhibition, just to give you a sense of it installed, the long um, ghost calls landscape painting cuts diagonally across the space. And there are a number of three-dimensional pieces which are thought of as drawings in three dimensions. And they're on these um, very basic looking tables which are based on the sorts of tables you get in science labs. So I thought of them as experiments that were being made um, on these uh, surfaces. This is called Weeping Willow. There are two figures in this um, piece. There's a figure in a um, waterfall and she's like a, a sort of spirit figure. That's how I think of her. Um, and she can't be seen by the other figure who is one of the keening women who is trying to tune into nature by holding these branches from the willow. But she hasn't seen yet what we can see, which is this very colorful painted cave. Um, and it's about kind of tuning into nature. And, and there are drawings in the show that sort of accompany these drawings in three dimensions. There are drawings in two dimensions that also um, kind of explore the same idea. So this is a woman in a landscape, exploring a landscape. This is a, a stones emitting some kind of um, uh, sound, maybe that we can't hear, and a woman calling out. This is another three-dimensional piece which is called Mirrored Landscape and the figure of the woman 
um, mirrors the bending of the tree. And um, I should say these are made out of, they're very handmade. They're made of uh, painted silk, painted velour, it's all hand sewn, uh, quilted um, velour. They're, they're very sort of basic, but they they really do try to pick up the language of the drawings. And this is um, a woman lying on a head, which a rock, which is a shape of a head. And it's like she's having a dream and she's sort of projecting a sort of dream. And um, the landscape around is like a sort of unconscious landscape. It's called Dreaming Woman. And again, there are drawings that accompany these three dimensional pieces. This one is called Drowned and it's about drowning in a kind of unconscious space, like a dream. Um, this is called Meeting Place. It's a painted and quilted silk tree uh, with these metallic uh, and velour leaves and a velour painted figure of a woman with a dog and they're embracing. And it's really to do with the notion of a kind of connection, connections to nature, not only through plants and uh, landscape, but also through animals. And in some of the animation, there's descriptions of a woman who's sort of connected to these wild hounds in the landscape. Um, but I also like this kind of way of thinking about nature in quite a sort of inventive and stylized way, which sort of explains maybe how these landscape um, ideas come about. And this is called um, Mountain in Moonlight. Um, in my drawings, you will have seen that there are figures who are floating or they're kind of arching backwards or they're kind of, you know, they're not standing upright. This is a figure who's like enthralled to the moon, which is a piece of uh, copper which is then threaded with metallic thread. So it's like moonbeams coming down and the mountain is papier mache and it's painted with metallic paints. And then you see a drawing in the background, which is of a woman with a wind bent tree. And um, finally, uh, I just want to show you how the animation um, is present in the space because it's on this large screen, which is uh, suspended from a pole from the ceiling. So it really has a presence in the space and the sound is continually playing, which the sound is the part for me, which holds together all the elements. So you get the atmosphere of the work through the sound as well as all the visuals. And uh, the soundtrack is um, something I make myself. And I'm going to show you now one of the Keening songs. It's uh, about two minutes. And um, then after that, it will be the end of the talk. But I just want to remind you that Keening is not singing, straightforward singing. So uh, the sound that you hear, um, maybe uh, that, that preface kind of maybe explains the sound that you'll hear. Okay.
So we got there in the end. Brilliant. <laughs> Thank you so much. And I'm so sorry we couldn't get you out of the technical glitches. But I think what was really clear, it was an amazingly cogent um, presentation despite all the glitches and so phenomenal to see the work. Um, I'm, As you know, I've been fortunate enough to see the exhibition um, and it is truly a phenomenal experience. It's incredibly immersive, it's incredibly poignant uh, and incredibly prescient in terms of the, the issues it addresses and that situating um, of the personal and the human uh, within that whole context that you've talked about around the politics, around this ghost call to the 20th century or from the 20th century. So really powerful and incredibly moving. Um, we do have a lot of questions coming in um, and I'm, I'll field them um, so that you can respond to them uh, and we can talk a little bit around it. We're absolutely fine for time. Um, so we've got a number coming in. So I think perhaps if we start uh, with, you've, we've just finished with the animation, which gives a sense of that kind of immersive world, but there is a question around how you make um, the sound and could you say a little bit more about it and how it was developed as much as sourced? I think you've talked about how it's sourced, that it's self-generated. Um, yeah, but perhaps you could say a little bit about how you developed it. Um, so um, sound has been in the work for a bit of time, like longer than the animations. And I, did I say that um, I only started making animations in the first lockdown because I couldn't get to the studio and it was something I'd wanted to do for ages. Um, so I've really only taught myself to do it this year. But um, I had sound in my work previously and with the birth piece that I showed in the Kunstmuseum in The Hague, that has a sound piece that goes with it, which is based on um, a very ancient uh, melody. And the truth is that I'd been making sound for myself without really thinking of it as in my practice for quite a long time on garage band in a very sort of rudimentary way. And then I made this piece of sound um, because I was originally showing that piece of work in a big space called Caustic Coastal in Salford. And I really thought what I need, I, I want to use sound to kind of connect the spaces together. So, um, you know, it was quite experimental, but the sound in um, Keening songs, the animation is, it's all electronic, electronic is kind of, that's the setting in Garage Band that I use. And um, it's my own voice recorded, which is why I was trying to sort of do a, um, you know, a warning to all of you that it's, it wasn't singing. Um, but it's very rudimentary. I'm just kind of recording sound and making uh, my own sound. Uh, but actually, I have to say that when I make the animations, when the animation is made, then maybe my favorite part is making the music and it's very fast. I just play along to what I watch and that becomes the soundtrack. Which, which seems, I mean, it's incredibly authentic, the sense that it's your voice and that this figure represents you as well and that sense of a portal out to the world which is then both felt through drawing making painting and sound so it's very guttural uh, yes. and that utterance is yeah. really distinctive within the practice so it is quite yeah. astonishing as a process and it's also astonishing that you taught yourself to animate in lockdown because they feel very accomplished and very um it's quite interesting. I have two sons who are in their 20s and they, you know, for me, the idea of like teaching myself all this software was quite daunting. And they said that if you just don't, if you don't know, mom, just Google it. And so honestly, <laughs> that's how I learned. I just figured it out. It's not as hard as it seems. Yeah. And that's so brilliant. And it's a great message to everybody <laughs> about how we learn to do things uh, and the necessity to make and how you go about it. It's terrific. 
Um, there are a number of questions coming in about the balance of text and image and how you um, create um, that mix between text, drawing, and, and there's a question which is from Aileen Lyon, which is about how do you decide what to draw and what to write and how, how does that come about in terms of the process? Um, it feels very um, sort of clear, I think, to me that some, some things work as images uh, and they maybe don't have words that go with them. They just visually work. And then other times there are things that are almost like sentences in my head that, that have to be text. You know, the, the, the way language works, the way visual language and written language works is, is very different, I think. And the images and the text, they don't um, serve one another in that the, the image doesn't illustrate the text, uh, the text doesn't describe the image. There, I, I think there are many layers to the way, the way that we think. So we, we can sort of know and think things without almost telling ourselves that we're thinking that. And then other times thoughts seem very sort of present and almost verbal. And I'm really trying to capture the sort of this, the layers, the multiplicity, the sort of fragmented quality of thought. Um, so that's why there are so many different sort of elements, I guess. Yeah, I think that's um, a really insightful way of positioning that. The other questions that are coming around that are the relationship to comics, graphic novels, um, and you know, is that a, an element or a way that the work might go? Is does that is that about thinking about the audience? You know, maybe attracting in a, a multi generational audience. Um, um, I I haven't been influenced at all by comics or um, by graphic novels at all. I mean, the way the work has developed, it's quite common that that I'm asked about that. You know, do I really love comics? And the truth is, I'm not, I'm actually not that. Um, you know, knowledgeable at all about comics. I don't really know anything about them. It, for me, it's more like a very um, sort of self-driven uh, wish to have the opportunity to make images if I want, use text if I want, combine anything if I want. Mm -hmm. um, and the idea of the, the only thing I'd say about a book um, you know, I would never say I won't do this or I won't do that, but it's more like one of the things that's very important, has been very important to me is the non-linear quality of the work. So if you look at an image and it has text in no order or, you know, imagery in no order, you sort of look around it. Like you might look at a Bruegel painting and you spend ages looking around it. There's no order. You, you sort of gather uh, meaning. And, and a book, because you turn pages in an order, it is more linear. But then having said that, as soon as you start making animation, then you realize, well, that is linear. And you do, I did have to think quite carefully about how do I, how do I use the linear when I've always relied on a, a kind of non-linear reading? Yeah, and that, thank you, that's a really terrific answer. And the one that follows on from this is from Robbie Wallace. Um, as the train goes by my um, studio that I'm talking to you from. Um, but Robbie Wallace is asking about the Celtic designs that have informed the work um, and asking, is there anything that has informed your own distinctive style for the figures and the landscapes? He also says he can't wait to see the show in real world, in real life. So, no, um, there isn't. Uh, there isn't a particular <clears throat> influence. There isn't something in particular that I look at, but I'm very fascinated by um, imagery that was made pre, uh, kind of pre-Renaissance. So before a kind of perspectival structure, the, the kind of imaginative space of, um, trying to trying to explain something that you don't fully know. Um, I, I'm really fascinated by the inventive quality of that, that sort of early, really early image making. And I'm really fascinated by um, Japanese prints and, you know, a lot of non-Western image making. Um, 
But there isn't, and, and you know, art made by untaught artists, I guess, but there isn't one thing. And, and you know, it, is, it isn't, I wouldn't say that I was influenced by something. I mean, I'm sure we all are influenced all the time, but I, I think that it really comes out of a, a will on my part just to make something that looks the way I want it to look. You know, the thing that I've got in my head. Um, I'm not looking at something else to guide me. Yeah, I think it's the power inventiveness around the image and the, the content matching that representation. I think that's what's very exciting about the work. Um, there's a, there are a number of questions about how large the drawings are for scale, exhibition and installation. And I think that's maybe thinking about how you scale up. They're all original works. So they're original drawings on silk or whatever yeah. they're. So the scale is quite phenomenal. And I think that's something that many people find quite astonishing. Uh, we're not used to seeing very large scale um, public pieces about private, if you yeah. like, under intimate subjects. Um, so I think it's a question of thinking about how you get from those very small drawings to uh, the 15 metre painting. Um, yeah, the, so the majority of the smaller drawings are about A3 size. And that, that's probably because they're made at a desk. So I just sit, sit at a desk and make as many drawings as I like. Um, and then when I think about how, when I've got a group of drawings and then I think about how they might be developed, how I can see a subject coming out of them and how they might be developed, it always is the case that I think it's a number of elements together. So it kind of has to become bigger in order to incorporate these elements. And then I start thinking about, you know, maybe the space that they're going to be seen in and what it's like to walk around and be um, sort of immersed in uh, an image world or a kind of visual language world. Um, and also there's something very important, I, I should have said this about the drawings are on um, paper, which is usually like locked up paper with leaves in it or um, cardi paper. So the materiality of the uh, surface is really important. It's like, it's a thing as much as it's an image. Yeah. And um, with, sorry, with the silk, for example, the silk paintings, they're a thing in space as much as they're images. So they sort of move about or they're, you know, they're, they're very sort of present, but very light. Uh, it, it's, it's how they uh, are present in space that drives them becoming sort of bigger things, I think. And it also drives their materiality, doesn't it? I mean, the, the large paintings almost breathe in the space because they're moving and shifting and they add to that both dreamlike epic quality um, of a space that's shifting and changing and that we're orienting towards. Um, there is a question about when you began to use um, textiles within the work. So I know there are a lot of questions around materiality, but it, it seems that the materiality and its equivalence to its intent is actually really important in the work. Um, so I think if you could talk a little bit about that shift, I mean, I've, I've known you for some time, um, <laughs> we weren't going to be giggled, giggled. Oh, shall we? Yeah. Um, <laughs> the, you know, the workers did, did used to be on canvas and did used to be on stretchers and that transition into this very immersive different world of three-dimensional things, shifting, yeah. encompassing, enveloping uh, work um, yeah. is a, a major transition and it's really fundamental to the success of the work. There's, there are a number of things and kind of bound up with that decision. And firstly, I think the, for me, the kind of premise that painting starts with a rigid stretcher, maybe primed uh, white, just seemed like already a set of modernist decisions that were already quite prescriptive about, you know, how you might use that space, what that space already is. And, um, I found that the edge, the rigidity and the edge of the stretcher was something that was really bothering me. And I, I didn't like it. Here I come up to the edge and I, you know, it's almost like a kind of uh, restriction that it should be a rectangle or that it should be, you know, rigid. So I 
um, I was just walking around one day and I suddenly, I suddenly thought, well, yeah, it doesn't have to be, you know, it could be something, painting could be something that you uh, drape over something or, you know, it could be something like a shawl, I was thinking. Um, and then, you know, that for me was, it sounds corny, but it was kind of a bit of a light bulb moment to think, oh, it doesn't, it doesn't have to look that way. It can be anything. It can be any shape. You can cut it. You can sew it. You can, you know, you can do, do what you like with this space that painting occupies. Um, and also the fabric that I use to paint on is um, crepe de chine chine, and it's dyed very pale pink. So it's really the sort of antithesis to what a kind of modernist in in days of yore might have said, you know, this is is the starting point for painting. It's deliberately a very um, kind of feminine materiality. It's deliberately something which would have been discarded as a a starting point for painting, except that in ancient cultures, silk was commonly used for painting and still is. So for me, it's like a, uh, it also has a sort of feeling of intimacy and, you know, you can fold it up really tiny. It is a great big monumental slab of a thing. It's it's a fantastic um, explication, I think, about the importance of materials and actually that representation of women by women and actually acknowledging that materiality that does spread across cultures and, and, and that positioning of the work, which I think does refer, is not necessarily influenced by, but refers to so many different representations um, of, of the female subject, of feminist and feminine um, reclamation of a subject matter is really important. We, we've still got a couple of questions, but I think we're at the point where we should be concluding. Um, I'd like to say a really big personal, heartfelt and amazing thank you, which I know is on behalf of everybody uh, in the audience um, and all of our community. It's been a real privilege to hear you talk about the work in such depth. And actually there are many, many things that we could continue to talk about this evening. It's a really rich, exhibition at DCA. It's really worth uh, seeing, however difficult it might be for people to get to see it. And we're really, really hoping that it will be open soon in the new year, because as you've said, you've actually got quite a lot of work out on show at the moment. And it's this very bizarre thing of it's made in the privacy of the studio, it's presented uh, yeah. in the gallery, and it's presented, and that's about having a response and a collaboration and a dialogue with an audience. So we truly do hope that we'll be able to see the show very soon and to see the work at the Millennium Galleries in Sheffield. Um, as East Side Projects has it's finished. finished. Long. Um, yeah, that work is now going to Kunsthalle Gießen uh, in February. Brilliant. So Emma, congratulations on your exhibition at DCA. I thank you for your lecture this evening. It's been a privilege to have you as our first guest for these this series. We apologise once again for the technology, but we could really hear and see a phenomenal body of work and to hear you speak to it and about it has been a real privilege. So can I say one enormous thank you and can I wish, I thank all of our audience for joining us and bearing with us on any technical things. I'm sure that you've really enjoyed hearing Emma talk about her work and the exhibition at DCA in particular. So thank you very much. We want to Wish you all well for the festive season that you have, a restorative period of time, and we very much hope that 2021 is going to be a different year to 2020. Can I say a huge thank you to everyone for joining us? Thank you. Good night. <laughs>